Welcome to the Autism and Neurodiversity Podcast. We're here to bring you helpful information from leading experts and give you effective tools and support. I'm Jason Grigla, a licensed counselor and founder of Techie for Life, a specialized mentoring program for neurodiverse young adults. And I'm Debbie Grigla, a certified life coach. And maybe most importantly, we're also parents to our own atypical young adults. Hello, friends. Welcome. I am so glad you're here, especially if you are a worrier. If you're a self-identified worrier, or if you just worry sometimes, this is what we're talking about today. Because worrying is one of the most unhelpful things that we can do as parents, to parent from fear. And it doesn't feel great. Okay, it feels terrible. It feels super stressful and anxious. And when you have an autistic or a neurodivergent child, teen, or young adult, that struggles and has challenges, there are plenty of things you could spend lots of time worrying about. What's going to happen to them? What if I don't know what to do to help them? What if they don't fit in or never have friends? What if they get bullied or taken advantage of? What if they have more meltdowns? What will we do if they aren't motivated? What if they don't do good in school? What if the school doesn't give them what they need? What if they get bad grades and can't get into a good college? What if they won't eat healthy and take care of their body and they're going to get diabetes? What if something bad happens to them? What if they'll never be capable of being independent? What will happen to them when I die? These are the kinds of worries that I hear a lot from parents, and I also struggled with many of these worries and spend a lot of time worrying about these kinds of things. And when you're worrying, not only does it feel terrible, it also doesn't make us better at our job of parenting. And it for sure doesn't help us support our kids' development if we're overindulging in worry. So let's talk about why it is so unhelpful. Besides the fact that it feels lousy, It also depletes us of energy. If you find yourself exhausted and close to burning out often, the worry habit might be a big contributor to that exhaustion for you. And I want you to think about what you do when you worry about your children. When I'm in in mom worry mode, my brain just spins and spins and it thinks of all the different angles of all the potential problems and how terrible it's going to be. And I get very anxious and worked up when I'm in that headspace. And I often see parents who overworry and go to the extremes and either avoid or procrastinate actually dealing with something that dealing with something that needs their attention, that needs to be addressed or taken care of, that they'll avoid it because they're so worried about it, or they'll attempt to control their child or control anyone who works with their child in an attempt to prevent something bad from happening. So I see those two extremes kind of pop up in the the big worriers. They're either avoiding or they're trying to control everything. And the other thing that is really common when we jump on that worry bus is that we have a tendency to catastrophize things or get very black and white, all or nothing in our thinking. Like it can only be the worst, you know, it can't possibly go well. Um, Just like those extremes. And it's really common to get really rigid and inflexible. Like it has to be a certain way because it feels like a life or death, dangerous thing that we're worried about that we're trying to prevent from happening. And so the, t- the type of thinking that fuels that worry or that the worry fuels, okay, it, it, it's not the kind of thinking that leads to being able to f- problem solve or figure things out or just relax because there's no problem at all. And one of the things that I've also noticed is that, and this is really important to be aware of, parents who ride the worry bus 
and are really good at finding things to worry about. I mean, some of you get really creative on the things that you're worrying about. If one thing does get resolved, okay, like, okay, you're worried about this. Let's resolve that. Let's figure it out. Okay, done. Guess what happens? If you're in that worry habit and you're used to riding that worry bus, your brain is going to find 10 more things to worry about to replace the one thing that got taken care of. And that's just how pervasive that this habit like expands to be. So when you're worried, I want you to think about how you show up as a parent. Anxious, controlling, graspy, suffocating. Do you get manipulative, impatient, overbearing, avoidant, stuck, panicked? Okay, worry does not fuel effective, helpful parenting, supportive parenting. And when you're in that worry energy, your brain is blocked. It cannot access solutions. You can't parent from confidence. You can't see obvious answers that are staring you right in the face. All you can see is all the problems and why it's so bad and terrible. And you, you also don't see what's actually working well and going well. And it, when we're in that worry space, we're not able to create more of the good, the more of the what's working, what's going well, like what's awesome in our life. Worry blocks you from your own parental wisdom and intuition, and it robs you of a sense of well-being and just general enjoyment of your parenting experience. And then I want you to think about how your worry and your anxiety affects your child, your teen, or your young adult. Because you're modeling and teaching them how to be worried and anxious and that the world is a dangerous and terrible place and we can't handle it. That's what you're teaching and modeling. You're adding stress to your interactions with them and their experience of life. And if you're thinking, well, Debbie, I don't let my kids know I'm worried about them. I mean, I've had parents tell me this. I I don't let my kids know that I'm worried about them. My answer to that is, it's impossible to hide it from them. You can't help but show that you are worried or anxious. They sense it. They may not know, they may not be completely aware consciously, but subconsciously they pick up on it. They, they sense it because when you're worried, like your choice of words is, is subtly affected, your facial expressions, um, your tone of voice. And and the words that you don't choose, what you aren't focused on, your kids sense it. You're not hiding it. Like, just stop fooling yourself right now. You're not hiding it. Your kids sense it. And if you are trying to hide it, that means you're trying to be fake with your kids. Okay. Is that really how you want to show up and parent your kids from a completely inauthentic, dishonest place? And you know what you aren't doing when you parent, when you're worried? You're not supporting your kids and equipping them to handle their problems and challenges with confidence. And many studies show a correlation between parents with elevated anxiety having kids with elevated anxiety and depression and other issues. Worry doesn't prevent bad things from happening. It doesn't help us solve problems. And it doesn't help us parent in loving, connected ways. Worry does keep you distracted. So years ago, I read a book called The Gift of Fear. Excellent book. I highly recommend it. Um, I will link to it in my show notes. But it was a, I think it was an FBI, if I remember right. It's been a while since I read it. But he was an FBI guy and he studied fear. And he studied scenarios where people were able to get out of very dangerous situations. And they were trying to figure out how did they get out of those dangerous situations. And what they discovered is, is that people, that our subconscious is actually really good at picking up on cues and, and noticing things. And these people that were able to get out of very dangerous situations, when they look back, they, they realize that they had noticed different things that kind of clued them in that this was dangerous. And they need to get out of there. And I thought that was so fascinating. And then what, so there's a gift, like our brains do pick up on things that we need to be aware of or that should bring us, you know, that 
should move us to action to to deal with it to to handle a situation but then this was interesting to me he talked about how when people like were imagining things like when they're worried like ooh there could be something there could be a bad guy like if you're walking down a dark street like ooh there could be somebody bad behind that dumpster or you know there could be someone dangerous behind that corner when you're distracted by imagined worries you actually your brain misses the actual cues of actual danger because you're distracted by imagined worries now when you think about that for a minute as a parent if you're so worried and caught up with on these imagined sort of catastrophizing type in the way into the future worries you're you're probably missing what's right in front of you you're missing opportunities to connect you're missing opportunities to teach to support to maybe intervene you're missing those because you're so worried about other stuff that could happen and you're not seeing what's actually in front of you so why do we worry i mean we've talked about it a little bit but i want to really point this out why do we worry well cuz you have a human brain okay and your brain's job, its number one job, is to keep you alive and safe. And so in primitive times, the brain was like looking out for, like, is there a potential tiger behind that bush, right? Because I need to book it the other direction if there's a tiger or be ready to, to defend myself. So the brain was looking out for life and death situations, okay? But now in modern times, it's not typical to have a tiger jumping out at you to eat you. Okay, but then we're, our brain is looking for, oh no, there, there could be a bad grade or there could be a bully. And we think, and the brain treats it like it's a life and death situation when it's not. It's actually not. And so if you are a worrier or you do worry at times, okay, good news. You have a human brain. You're normal. And that brain that's trying to help you sometimes isn't super helpful, right? It's not very useful when we're just imagining these worries. And it, it feels productive to the brain. Well, I'm worrying about these things. Like I'm, I'm trying to be a good parent. I'm like, it, it, it feels productive to the brain, but really it just keeps you stuck sitting there. You're really not doing much when you're in that worry space, right? So when you're in that worry space, it's not helping. There's no life or death typically. And if there was, you would handle that like you would deal with it right but worry doesn't actually do anything it's not productive it doesn't move you forward it keeps you stuck spinning or getting super graspy and controlling and the problem with that worry too is that our brain will spin on it and then it's going to keep looking for proof and evidence for why we should be very worried and i think we some of us really believe that that is what a good parent does they worry about their kids And maybe that's you. Maybe you believe that this is what a good parent does, that you should worry about your kids. But what if you're wrong about that? What if you're more effective as a parent when you don't worry? For many of you, it's such a habit and how you are in the world that you would actually feel really uncomfortable without constantly worrying. It's like your favorite stuffy or your favorite blanket. It's almost like if you didn't worry, something bad might actually happen. When your worry doesn't prevent anything, it just makes you miserable. So you stay in that very comfortable, but very miserable spin of worry all the time. And your neurodivergent child, teen, young adult is going to have challenges whether you worry or not. They're supposed to have challenges. And worry doesn't change that. So now what? If you would like to manage your worrying brain better so that you can better support your kids' development and their sense of well-being and actually build a a close, connected relationship with them where you're able to collaborate with them and, and support them in their development, I have several tools that can help you, and I want to offer a few here for this episode. I want you to first ask yourself, is this worry helpful or hurtful? If it's hurtful, if it's really, there's nothing to be worried about. It's just, yeah, there's all these million possibilities, right? But if 
If the thing you're worrying about is not actually helpful to be worrying about, thank your brain for trying to be helpful and then get back to thinking about what would be helpful. I also encourage you to make peace with those worst case scenarios that your brain is offering and ask yourself how you could actually still be okay, even if the worst were to happen. How can you be okay, even if it's hard or sad or disappointing or all those kinds of things? How can you still be okay? And here's a big one. If you've really got the habit of worrying, and this is something you've done for a long time, maybe you're mom was a worrier. I mean, my mom's a worrier. My grandma's a worrier. It runs in my family. And I'm very happy to be off that worry train, that worry bus most of the time. I challenge you to give equal time, okay, because you're really good at all the worst case scenarios. But I challenge you to give equal time to best case scenarios. I mean, if we're going to imagine things, we might as well give equal time to positives, like to the miracles, to the wonderful things that can happen to the best case scenarios. Your brain's default is always going to be worst case scenario. So you actually have to intentionally create the habit of of giving equal airtime to the best case scenarios. And you know what? They're way more fun to think about. I promise. And then I encourage you to try on some worry buster thoughts. Okay, so some of mine are, and there's lots of them, but in, in different situations too, but like some general ones that I, that are go-tos for me are to agree, like with my brain, if it's like offering up a, oh no, this could happen. Be like, yeah, of course it could, it could happen and we'll figure it out if it does. We'll figure it out. I also kind of get sarcastic with myself and I'd be like, yeah, I should totally spend all my time and energy today worrying about this thing that hasn't happened, that may never happen, that probably will never happen, that's totally out of my control. I can't do anything about it. It's unsolvable today, et cetera, right? Like I should totally spend all my energy worrying about that. Yeah, hard no on that one, okay? So I kind of will get a little bit sarcastic with myself. And I I just love just in general to believe that no matter what, it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. Some of my, some of the biggest growth and development that I personally have experienced has been from going through hard things. So even though the hard thing, you don't want to go through it, right? I'm like, I didn't want to go through some of the hard things that I've been through. I'm grateful for what I gained from that hard thing. I'm grateful for the things I learned, for the ways that I developed as a person through going through that experience. I mean, I certainly wouldn't be here devoting time on a podcast if I hadn't been through hard things with my own kids and wanting to be able to offer help and support to all of you. I I wouldn't be here if I had an easy go of it. And I'm grateful to be able to have some things to offer you so that you can have a, a better experience or go through it in a different way than I did. You don't have to do it the hardest way that you can have an easier go. And so yeah, like no matter what happens, it's going to be okay. So I want you to think about what thoughts help you calm your runaway worry spinning brain and think about those and which ones could be your go-tos. Parenting a neurodivergent child, teen, young adult is challenging enough. It's challenging enough. Let's not 10 exit with fueling our life with worry. That just makes it so much harder. Like, let's deal with what's right in front of us and like, let tomorrow take care of itself. And let's enjoy today. I hope you have an amazing best case scenario week. And make sure that if you you get on my email list, um, because I have some good stuff coming out and I don't want you to be missing out on it. So make sure you get on my email list. Have an amazing week. Take care. Thanks for joining us on this episode of Autism and Neurodiversity with Jason and Debbie. If you want to learn more about our work, come visit us at jasondebbie.com. That's J-A-S-O-N-D-E-B-B-I-E.com. dot